Good afternoon. Welcome to the St. John Paul II Bioethics Center Annual Lecture. I'm Tom Davis. I'm the director of the St. John Paul II Bioethics Center at Holy Apostles College in Cromwell, Connecticut. I'm a deacon of the Melkite Greek Catholic Church, and it's my privilege to introduce today's presentation. The Bioethics Center is a project inspired by the great St. John Paul II, who wrote in his first encyclical, Redentor Hominis, that the development of technology and the development of contemporary civilization, which is marked by the ascendancy of technology, demand a proportional development of morals and ethics. So the aim of the Bioethics Center is to engage the modern project with an ethic based on natural law principles. One of the most dramatic clashes between the modern project and classical natural law concerns the embodied sexuality of the human person, which in Christian ethics is a given of creation. And this plays out in the modern debates over homosexuality, gay marriage, gender theory, uh, which I think almost every awake person is aware. Today I am pleased to introduce uh, Father Sebastian Carnazzo, uh, who will present a lecture entitled, And Such Were Some of You. Father Sebastian uh, holds a doctorate degree from the Catholic University of America. He has taught sacred scripture at Our Lady of Guadalupe Seminary in Denton, Nebraska, St. Patrick's Seminary of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, and Christendom College. And he is now the pastor of St. Elias Melkite Catholic Church in San Jose, California. He is a frequent speaker on pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and is the author of numerous publications, including his book, Seeing Blood and Water, a Narrative Critical Study of John 1934. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Father Sebastian Carnazzo. Thank you, Deacon Tom. I was asked to speak today on the topic of homosexuality and the Bible. The title of this talk is and such were some of you. And such were some of you. This is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. We will talk about that later. There is a lot of confusion today about what the Bible says concerning homosexuality. You'll hear on the media, on the internet, various ideas. Anyone listening to this lecture could do a quick Google search and find a myriad of arguments showing that the Bible condemns homosexuality. You will also find a myriad of arguments showing that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. Some will even suggest that the concept of homosexuality cannot even be found anywhere in sacred scripture. This is the topic we are discussing today. We are going to be looking at eight passages from the sacred scriptures, both Old and New Testament. Our first passage is in Genesis chapter 1, a text that most of us know well. If you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to turn with me now and throughout the lecture to these various passages. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is the seven day creation account. In six days, God creates the world. This is beautiful theological poetry. On the sixth day, the climax of the creation, God creates the land animals. But then there's a pause. He deliberates for a moment. Let us create man in our image and likeness. What does this mean? Well, Christians from early times until today have debated this topic. But in general, looking at the context, 
particularly chapter 5 of this same book. And from our own experience, we know that we look and we are like our parents. This is familial language to say that man was made as God's children. A theme that is throughout the Holy Scriptures and we find even in John's Gospel in his prologue when he meditates on this creation account. In his conclusion to the prologue, it says that this is God's purpose, that we might be his children. And this is the reason, of course, John tells us that Jesus came to restore that original plan. The story goes on in verse 27. So God created man in his own image and likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the text goes on. We're looking at this passage today because this is the first text of sacred scripture that addresses the question of homosexuality and the Bible. Here we find that when God first creates mankind, he makes them male and female. He does not make them male and male, nor does he make them female and female, nor does he make them male and female and female. Often we'll note uh, in the book of Genesis and other places that there is polygamy found in the Bible. Christians have sometimes suggested that the idea of polygamy is allowed. Or do we not even see it among the patriarchs? Such an individual has clearly not read those stories very carefully and surely not read the introduction to this book where we find God making two individuals, one male and one female. The rest of the stories of polygamy in the book of Genesis, when found among the patriarchs, are always found in the context of a negative story. There's something wrong. And any one of these examples of polygamy, if the reader examines them carefully, will see is filled with condemnations of the idea. There is no happiness found in polygamy. More on that later. We also find in this passage, in verse 28, that God blessed them. Now, when God blesses in the Bible, it is always the gift of life. It is God sharing his life with us. Theologians speak of this as grace. God shares his life with us, and that life is life-giving. It allows us to then share in his eternal life. Again, one of the most important, if not the most important themes of all of salvation history. God blessed them. And in case we missed that theme of blessing, that gift of life, the author then says that God told them to be fruitful and multiply. This is what they are to do with that life he has given them, to be fruitful and multiply. This is also an important text for our study today because it is only in a heterosexual relationship among human beings that we can find the ability to procreate. And so the text comments on our subject today in two ways. One, we find that God makes man as male and female. And two, we find the purpose for them being made as male and female, and that is to procreate. This is something impossible in a homosexual relationship, male and male 
or female and female. The next text we will examine is in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis has two creation stories. They are very similar and yet very different. And both were seen as so valuable in the early Jewish tradition that they were kept together side by side. Chapter 2 of the book of Genesis Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, when we hear helper in the English, we may think of a, the help around the house, something like that. A French maid, maybe. This is not what we're talking about. A helper fit for him in the Hebrew here an assistant, a counselor, a partner that is his perfect match. And so we hear about God bringing all sorts of animals from the mud, from the dirt, as he had created Adam, and bringing them to the man to see what he would say and what he would call them. The purpose here in this chapter is the same as what we find in the first chapter, is to show that man is different than the rest of creation. The trees, the plants, the fish, the birds, and even the rest of the land animals in chapter 1 are all shown to be distinct from man. Different. Though he is a creature and a land creature created on that sixth day with the other land animals, the author pauses there and the tone changes as we come to the most sacred moment of God's creation, the creation of his children in his image and likeness. This was intended for the original audience of that text to understand that man is different from all of creation. He is like God. This is catechesis. In the ancient world, polytheism. Polytheism, the worship of many gods and any form of paganism often borrowed from the created world to understand the various deities they worshipped. Any of you who have studied maybe the pantheon of Egypt or any other ancient pantheons, you have seen images of the gods with a frog head or an eagle head, etc. Think of the worship of the god Apis in the form of a bull calf. Most people know of that story from Exodus chapter 32. And so in the catechesis of chapter 1 and also chapter 2, we find the author, or the two authors here, showing the audience that man is distinct from the rest of creation. He is a creature. He was, in this chapter now, drawn from the mud like the other animals were eventually drawn from the mud. But he is the one that names them. To name something in the ancient world, and even today, is to have dominion or power over it. In chapter 1, we heard that God gave them the power of dominion over the animals. That is, they are above them. Not to abuse them, but to use them for good. In chapter 2, we find that same teaching in another way. The animals coming to Adam, and he names them. We all know from our experience, maybe when we were a child, getting a pet from the pet store. What do we do when we first get home? We name the pet. When a child is born into a home, a family, the parents name the child. It is a, an exercise of authority. And so we're told in the story here that Adam names the animals to show that he's distinct from them. But then God brings forth something else for him after it is clear to the audience of this text that Adam is different from these animals. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. And he draws from him one of his ribs. This is in verse 21. And from this rib, it says, he fashioned the woman. <laughs> 
and brought her to the man. Sometimes people will think this is the reason why men have one less rib than women. Or maybe that's why the story was created. Well, that's not why the story was created. And men do not have one less rib than women. The purpose of the story as the ancient Jews understood was to show that woman was not like the animals. It was a way to show, as we saw in chapter 1, that both man and woman were made in the image and likeness of God, distinct from the rest of creation. Here the author in chapter 2 tells this in another way, that the animals were all named by Adam, and they were all drawn from the mud. But this one was taken from his own flesh showing that the origin of the woman is in the man, and therefore they are of the same flesh, as we will hear in a few verses. The ancient rabbi said this was so that the man would know that she was not one of the beasts to have dominion over. She was taken, therefore, not from the mud. She was taken from his flesh, but not from his head, lest she and he think that she was above him. She was taken not from his feet, lest he think she is something to be trampled upon, but rather taken from his side to show God's original plan, that she would be his partner in this creation. You'll note here it says that the man in verse 23, says, This is at last bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. English is one of the few languages where this actually works, as it does in Hebrew. Ish is man. Isha is woman. And that ah ending there in some Hebrew words can mean from. And so we get that also in English in a certain sense, man and woman. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So they were one flesh, she was taken from him, and now they become one flesh again. Again, this is the way the author in chapter 2 is trying to show us the same thing we saw in chapter 1. And then finally, not only are they distinct from all of creation, they are made in the image and likeness of God, as we saw in chapter 1, here that being described in this other way, but just like we saw in chapter 1, that God blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. Intimately related to the fact that he created them as male and female. We find a parallel text here. Verse 24, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Most intimately, of course, in the marital union. And as a second reference to that, the text says in verse 25, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Again, this is the author in chapter 2 speaking of the same topic, of that intimacy of the marital union between a man and a woman. There is much more to this text if we had time to discuss, but we must move on for our subject today. Turn with me now to chapter 9 of this same book, where we hear a repetition of the original story of chapter 1. There's been a flood. Mankind has been wiped out. Adam is long gone. Noah comes forth from the ark as the new father of humanity, as the new Adam. And any careful read of chapters 8 and 9 will show you that. For our purpose here, we'll focus on the first verse of chapter 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. How are they to do this? Because they brought with them their wives. On the ark were Noah and his wife and his three sons, as we hear 
in the previous chapters with their wives. So again, we have a parallel to Genesis 1 where we find God emphasizing this point again, or the author showing us the importance of this aspect of the creation. Noah is here, as all commentators will show, a new Adam. And then we hear that he is blessed to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Male and female, he created them. Turn with me now to chapter 18. Chapters 18 and 19 in the book of Genesis tell us about a story that most people associate with our subject today. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction. In order to appreciate the story which occurs in chapter 19, we have to rewind a bit back to chapter 18. As you probably know, chapter divisions didn't come into the Bible until around the 12th century. Sometimes they're not in the best place and sometimes divide the text that then hinders us from hearing the whole context. But they are helpful, as you did just turn to chapter 18 when I told you. Chapter 18, verse 16, God has just visited Abraham, and he has promised to Abraham and to Sarah that they would have a son. In their old age, after all of this time of, of sterility, not being able to conceive, God has been promising all along that someday Abraham and Sarah would have descendants like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the heavens. These are in the previous chapters. Now God has come to Abraham and Sarah in their very old age and told them that this time next year, Sarah will have had a son, and you shall name him Isaac. After having said that, after having given this beautiful, beautiful prophecy of life, then, in verse 16, we hear a contrast. This is chapter 18, verse 16. Then the men set out from there. God has appeared to Abraham in human form, and he has with him two angels in human form. These are the two angels that guard God's holiness wherever he goes. You can think of the cherubim guarding the way to the tree of life after Adam and Eve's exile from the garden. You can think of the cherubim that Moses will build on top of the ark where God will rest between them in Exodus chapter 25. You can think of the large cherubim that will guard the holy of holies that Solomon will put in his temple in 1 Kings chapter 6. Here we find God coming to Abraham, guarded by his two angels. In chapter 18, verse 16, the men, or these three who have come in human form, set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The geography is a bit helpful here. Abraham is up in the hill country of Judea. As you head east from the hill country of Judea, as you head east, you eventually drop into the basin that is what we call the Dead Sea. And it is somewhere in that basin that archaeologists all agree was the original villages or towns that were associated with this story. So you can imagine them on the edge of a, of a hill, the brow of a, of a hill or a cliff, looking down into the valley. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham when I'm about to do? Now, we all know the story, what he's about to do. He's going to send his angels down to judge the city. And then the city, in fact, the city surrounding it, will be destroyed. So he deliberates now, as we heard back in chapter 1. Shall I, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. No, 
that is, I shall not hide it. For I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. What's that great promise? You remember in chapter 12, verse 3, through your seed, through your son someday, through your descendants, all the nations shall be blessed. That was the purpose of the call of Abraham. After the flood, we heard about all of these generations that came from the family of Noah. And one man was called. But he was called for the sake of all of those from whom he was called. So that through his seed someday, through his descendancy, all of the nations of the earth could be blessed. All could be brought back into a covenantal relationship. All could be brought back into the family of God. And so God speaks in this way. It's like a parent thinking about whether or not they're going to tell their child about certain things of life. I have seven children. The youngest, uh, they know about the things that children know about. But there are certain evils in this world that I have not yet talked to them about. They're not yet ready. Any parent listening to this lecture has deliberated likewise. And so God here says, I will tell him. I will tell him. Why would there be a hesitation? How do you talk to Abraham about what is about to happen? The horrible evils in Sodom and Gomorrah and the fact that they will be destroyed. But he concludes, no, I do need to tell him about that. Because Abraham is going to be the father of many nations and through his seed all the nations shall be blessed. It is critical that Abraham tell his descendants about this story. And so this is the author showing us why this story is in the text. So that Abraham and his descendants would know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and why. This is helpful because often we think of these stories in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, as possibly either random collections of stories or maybe a camcorder version of history. It is neither. It is catechesis, as the Jews referred to the five books of Moses, the Torah, the direction, catechesis, teaching. Verse 20, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry which has come to me. And if not, I will know. This is speaking of God in an anthropomorphic way, as we find throughout the book of Genesis and the rest of the Bible. Anthropomorphism is in the sacred text to help us relate, of course, to the eternal God. Verse 22 so the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. We then find in the text a discussion between Abraham and the Lord regarding how many people it will take to save Sodom and Gomorrah. As Abraham barters with God, will you destroy all of them if there are righteous in the city? Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked so that the wicked perish like the, the righteous and the righteous perish like the... This doesn't make sense. This doesn't seem just. And he begins to barter with God about how many it will take to keep the city from destruction. If you find 50 there that are righteous, God says, for the 50, I will. I will not destroy the city. What about 40? Absolutely. What about 30? What about 20? What is Abraham? What is Abraham's concern? His nephew Lot and nephew's wife and kids are down in that city. And Lot is his uncle and his foster father. It's his job to protect them. And so he's concerned about whether or not Lot is going to be destroyed. In chapter 19, 
The two angels came to Sodom. These are the two angels that departed from Abraham and God as they were deliberating. The two angels now arrive. They've gone down into the basin and they now arrive in the city of Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, turn aside, I pray you, to your servant's house and spend the night. And wash your feet, then you may rise up early and go on your way. The text is sometimes suggested to be all about hospitality or inhospitality. Hospitality is certainly an element in the story. As it was in the previous story, Abraham and Sarah welcoming God into their presence. In fact, there is a beautiful icon from the ancient tradition called the hospitality of Abraham in which we see Abraham and Sarah feeding God and his two angels. Later on in artwork, it became the Holy Trinity. That's for another lecture. We find also then in this story the same theme of hospitality, sure. But that is not the major theme, as we'll see. Lot has been sitting at the city gate, a place where the wise elders sit. And he sees two visitors coming to the city and welcomes these two men into his home, not knowing, of course, who they were. So he says, my lords, turn aside, I pray you, to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may go on your way. They said, no, we will sleep in the street. Now, this is not insulting. This is the way this works in the Middle Eastern culture. This is to say, yes, but we want to be polite about it. And so he says again, no, no, you must, you must. And so, okay, fine, we'll come to your house. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made for them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, notice the author, what he's doing here with the repetition, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to, to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Now, this is where if you do a Google search on the internet and try to find a website that teaches that the Bible does not condemn homosexuality and that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is really just a story about hospitality. This is usually where they will end the discussion and jump to the next text. You have to read this very carefully. Bring them out that we may know them. A simple read might say, well, look at that. They just want to get to know the people in the house. Fair enough. They have visitors. Yada in the Hebrew, which is translated here to know, has a wide range of meaning. It can mean the acquisition of information to get to know somebody, to get to know a subject. But it can also mean, along with other things, it can be a reference to sexual relation. We see that, in fact, in the very first occurrence of this verb in the Hebrew text earlier in the book when it says that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Most people are familiar with this usage. What usage is in this text? Well, it's quite clear. Verse 6, Lot went out the door to the men, shut the door after him and said, I beg you. Brothers, do not act so wickedly. Now, if they were just coming to share some tea and crumpets and get to know these two men, why would Lot refer to this as wickedness? Obviously, Lot perceives something else going on. He interprets their actions as not an attempt to acquire information about these two individuals, to get to know them, but rather intimate sexual union. 
And he refers to this as something wicked. Do not do this wicked thing. Verse 8. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known man. We obviously can see the usage there. Let me bring them out to you, and you do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. There's that hospitality issue there. Hospitality. They've come under my roof. In the Middle East, it is a very important virtue to care for, protect, to, uh, to provide for someone who has entered into your home. And so, yes, there is a hospitality issue here, as there is in many stories in the Bible. But that's not the theme of the story. Lot has offered his two daughters who have not known man. Obviously, he understands this crowd's intention, at least partly. Now, I hope that anyone listening to this lecture or anyone who has ever read the story cringes when they hear those words. The author is hoping that you have a basic human conscience. And if you don't cringe, if you don't realize that this is highly imprudent of Lot at this point, you won't understand the end of the story when he gets what's coming to him. Part of the text that we cannot address today. Moving on, though, Look what happens. They said, stand back. Stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn. And he would play the judge? Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Very important verse. The crowd of men, both young and old, all of the men of the city have gathered around Lot's house, and they've demanded that the two men who have come as visitors, they, like Lot, do not actually know these are angels yet, demand that those two men be brought out so that they may have their way with them. We would call that in modern language gang rape, in this case, homosexual gang rape. Lot has understood this and suggested as an alternative for the sake of his visitors, again, highly imprudent, I would say, as a father. He has suggested for the sake of his visitors that they take his two daughters, two virgin girls who have not known a man, and do with them as they please. Why would he suggest this? Because he knows their intent. They are, in, they are intending to satisfy their sexual desire. And Lot recommends these two daughters as an alternative. But note, not only has he misunderstood their intent, at least the entirety of it, but also note that they reject that option. Their intent here, as some will suggest, is to, to satisfy their lust. The story, while some will acknowledge, is not simply about hospitality. Surely there's a sexual issue here. Uh, there's some immorality, some sexual licentiousness. But this is really a story about unbridled lust. And this is why those cities were destroyed. It is certainly about unbridled lust, but of a particular kind of unbridled lust. And it is clear in the text by the fact that they reject the two girls and want, rather, the two men that are in the home. And notice also something that often is ignored. They understand that what they are to do is evil. Now we will do 
worse with you, Lot, than we were going to do with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break down the door. Verse 10, but the men put forth their hands and brought Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves groping for the door. And the story goes on with the destruction of the cities in the region, Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest. And of course, as I said at the end, what happens to Lot as a result of what he offered with his daughters. There's a theme in the book of Genesis that we find here and elsewhere, you reap what you sow. And this is why it is very important to use that conscience as you're reading a story, any story in the book of Genesis. If something seems odd or strange to you, let it, let it make you uncomfortable. Let it be that rather than ignore that and then you will understand and see the resolution later on. This is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is because of this story that homosexuals have often be re been referred to as sodomites or the act of homosexuality as sodomy. Most people are at least vaguely familiar with this. But these are not the only texts in the scriptures that comment on this problem. Also in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, we have as the central book, the book of Leviticus. Turn with me, if you have a Bible with you, to Leviticus chapter 18. As I mentioned, and as most people know, there are five books. These five books at the head of the Old Testament is called the Torah, the teaching, the catechesis, the direction. The Jews understood the five books of Moses to actually have an arrangement in which the book of Leviticus is held up as the heart of the Torah so that it comments on what is before and what is after. And in fact, the book of Leviticus is quite interesting. In its central part, it has what is called the Holiness Code, chapters 17 through 22. And that is because in the very central verse of that central section of this central book, in the heart of the heart of the heart of the Torah, we hear in chapter 19, verse 2, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Kadosh in Hebrew means to be set apart, distinct, different from the ways of the nations. And that's important to understand then when we look at this text because we are reading here now in not only the central book of the Torah, but we're reading in that central section, the Holiness Code. In chapter 18, in chapter 18, verse 22, having just heard about the condemnation of child sacrifice to Moloch, in verse 22, we hear this. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Though some, typically those who have not read the story very carefully, some will argue that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is simply about unbridled lust or simply about lack of hospitality or whatever the case may be. It is quite clear here in the Torah that the ancient teaching of Judaism was that homosexual union is an abomination. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Verse 23 is also important. The following verse. And you shall not lie with any beast and defile yourself with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to a beast to lie with it. It is a perversion. It is helpful to see where this text 
the condemnation of homosexuality, sits within the Torah. As I mentioned, it is not only in the central book of the Torah, it is within the Holiness Code, which ancient Judaism saw as the most sacred laws of the entire Torah. But furthermore, in the immediate context, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination, we find that this verse is laid in the midst of two other very important condemnations that are related. The previous verse condemned child sacrifice. Verse 21, you shall not give any of your children to devote them by fire to Moloch, one of the ancient pagan gods of the region, and one in which they also sacrificed their children. You shall not give any of your children to devote them by fire to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. The divine name is given there in Hebrew. The verse before this condemnation of homosexual union is a verse that is intimately related to it. Neither shall you use your heterosexual union to produce children, that is, create life, so that you may put it to death. And then the next verse, nor shall you engage in a union, in this case a homosexual union, in which you cannot create life. The third verse, that is the verse which then follows verse 22, the verse that frames this condemnation of homosexuality with the verse against child sacrifice, is verse 23, which is a condemnation of bestiality, to use modern English. Both male and female. No surprise there. And so when we look at this text, this is not simply a random law, as some will sometimes suggest, that happens to be somewhere in the law of Moses. But rather, it is in the central book of the five books of Moses, and actually within the Holiness Code, which was understood by the ancient Jews to be the heart of the Torah, containing the most sacred laws that God had given to man. It is here also, by the way, that in chapter 19 we hear that the Israelites were commanded by God to love their neighbor as themselves. Most people are familiar with that law from the New Testament. But Jesus is simply repeating for them one of these most sacred laws. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Now, there are lots of other interesting passages we could look at related to these texts we've just examined and others. But for the sake of time, we will now move to the New Testament where we find some other passages that are intimately related to our subject. Turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Mark chapter 10. This is one of Jesus' condemnations of divorce. Parallel passages are found in the other Synoptic Gospels. Any Bible has an index in it where you can find those. Chapter 10. And he left there, that is Jesus, and went to the region of Judea. He is finished with his Galilean ministry after three years and is now beginning the trek down the Jordan Valley toward Jerusalem. He left there and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan and crowds gathered to him again and again and as, as his custom was, he taught them. Verse 2. And the Pharisees came up in order to test him. So who are the Pharisees? We often think of them as hypocrites, even in modern English. We say, don't be such a Pharisee, which often means someone who is wrapped up in legalism, 
This is not what the word means in the original text. While Jesus does condemn the, the movement toward the end of his time in Jerusalem, just before he's taken captive, you know about the woes against the Pharisees and scribes in Matthew chapter 23. We're not quite there yet. Jesus condemned them with such harsh words there in Matthew chapter 23 because these were the religious authorities of the time, along with the Sadducees and the priestly class, and they had a huge responsibility to teach the people. But while they were teaching the people one thing, they were doing something else, as he says. More on that in another lecture. Here in verse 2 of chapter 10 of Mark's Gospel, we hear about the Pharisees coming. The Pharisees were the parashim, the separated ones. They were a movement that began sometime before this moment. Their origin is a bit of a mystery, but most would suggest somewhere about maybe a century before this, two centuries maybe even. They're a movement that begins to develop along with other sects of Judaism, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes, and so on, to try to answer the questions of the day. For 500 years, they've been waiting for the, the exile to come to an end. Sure, they've returned, as Nehemiah says in his book. Sure, they've returned, Ezra prays there, to their land, but they are still in exile. They're still ruled by a foreign nation. They're, they're taxed by foreign nations. They're not yet really free. And so, fast forwarding a few centuries here, we come to this period where Judaism is now broken into multiple uh, factions that are trying to answer the question, why has there been a delay in the return of the glory cloud to the temple? Why has there been a delay in the return of the Messiah, the ancient king of the line of David? More on that in another lecture as well. These Pharisees then would have been in this context considered to be the specialists of religion. These would be the theologians and the pious ones often in any one of the communities. Synagogue rulers would often have been Pharisees. The Pharisees came up in order to test him. So something has changed. Earlier in the Galilean ministry, of Jesus, the Pharisees came up to him in order to learn about him to see if he might be the long-awaited Messiah. By now, after three years, they've concluded that he is not, and even worse, he's a heretic misleading the people. And so now they're testing him along the way as he's approaching Jerusalem, and the testing will increase in intensity. Over and over, they will try to trip him up. The Sadducees will come in for a try. The Pharisees will come in for a try. The Herodians will come in for a try. They're testing him as he heads toward Jerusalem. And they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, why would they ask this? Matthew's gospel gives us a little more information for any cause. There was a debate among the Pharisees at the time. Was it lawful to divorce your wife? Was this God's plan originally? Well, surely it was, the answer came, because Moses allowed us to divorce our wives. But for what cause? In Deuteronomy, it refers to a, an infelicity. That's a bit vague. And so among the Pharisees, there were two camps on this. They all agreed that surely it was allowed to divorce your wife. Moses had even given a law. But for what reason? What is this infelicity? Some suggested that it was in reference to something uh, that the wife might do that would destroy their marital covenant. Uh, she goes out and becomes a prostitute. She commits adultery, some sort of public licentiousness or something like that. But other Pharisees said, no, it's for any cause, anything that would make the husband unhappy. 
even if she might burn the toast in the morning. So for whatever reason, you could divorce your wife. So they come to Jesus to see where he's going to sit on this and to try and trip him up. And he answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to put her away. But Jesus said to them, for your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. In Matthew's gospel, there you have, it was not so. It, from the beginning, it was not so. He, though, allowed you to do this through Moses. This was an allowance because of the hardness of your heart. But this was not God's original plan. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. What Jesus has just done is very common in Jewish exegesis of the time. We have many examples of this in the New Testament and also in the Dead Sea Scrolls of splicing together two related texts from the Old Testament and therefore interpreting them as one. Jesus shows us that we were on good ground in the beginning of our lecture here today by looking at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 together and related. He splices them together here in his summary. He says, God made them male and female. That is the allusion to chapter 1. God said, let us make them in our own image and likeness. And so God made them in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. But then Jesus pulls in here chapter 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one. This is now Jesus commenting on it. So they are no longer two, but one, Jesus says. And he goes on to say, What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The reason why we're examining this text, some of you might wonder, is but is this about the topic of homosexuality? It is because this text tells us again Jesus' teaching on marriage. Jesus' teaching on marriage is dependent upon and in accord with what we saw in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We find here also Jesus commenting that marriage is not to be broken by divorce. We also find here Jesus, in his quotation of chapters 1 and 2, referring to the original creation as male and female, and that what God did originally is God's original plan, and that what Jesus has come to do is restore that original plan. Anyone picking up a solid commentary on the New Testament will find the commentator telling you that the authors of the New Testament understood the New Covenant, understood Jesus' mission, understood the mission of Paul, understood the purpose of the church as a restoration of the Edenic paradigm. The restoration of God dwelling with man for all eternity in a covenant of eternal life, eternal life. And so we find Jesus commenting on that here. Let's turn now 
to some passages in the Pauline epistles. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Most of you recall that Paul went on many journeys as he founded churches throughout Asia Minor and Greece. On his second journey, he founded the church in Corinth. On his third journey, while he was still in Ephesus, he received a letter from the church in Corinth about certain problems that were there. We hear that the community in Paul's absence has begun to return to the types of activities with which they were familiar before they became Christian. Sexual licentiousness, all sorts of immorality, even to the degree of worshiping in pagan temples and going to the cult prostitutes. And so Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus to correct them regarding these particular issues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not know that the unrighteous, the wicked, the unjust, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. This is a very important statement in this letter. He's been telling them all along what they should do and what they cannot do. And here he states very clearly for them some of the problems he sees or has heard about in the church in Corinth. Errors, sinful activity to which they have returned as if they had never been baptized before. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, and I have the Greek text here, that would be helpful. Translations vary significantly in this verse, and so I thought I would also give you the Greek as we go along here. Do not be deceived, neither the immoral, the, the word here, immoral, Porni, porni, plural form of pornos. Now, most people in English are at least vaguely familiar with that, that root, right? We have the uh, word pornography, right? Pornografia. That is the writing down or making of an image of a sexually licentious thing. Pornografia, or pornography, as we have in the English. Do not be deceived, neither porny, porny. So what does it mean here in the context? In general, this would be sexually licentious men, to use it in that vague sense. It could refer to uh, men who run after prostitutes, which is probably a good guess given the context of the letter here and the problem in Corinth. It could refer to even male prostitutes, but that term will come up later. Most translations put here the immoral. It should say more clearly those who are sexually immoral. It's very specific here on the type of immorality. Neither porni, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, our word in English, idolatry, comes right from the Greek. The worship of false gods. Neither miki. This is a, a noun in Greek, in the plural here. Those who are adulterers. Those who are adulterers. Most translations here are consistent. 
And then here is where we find a lot of variation among the translations, and this is primarily why I wanted to look at the Greek text with you. The last two categories are malaki, malaki, malakos, malakos, an effeminate one. Literally in the, in the Greek, this root means one who is soft. It's one who is soft. One who has become effeminate. Some translations will put here effeminate. I think the old King James Bible did that, which is probably a, a pretty good uh, guess at the word. Some translations will put male prostitute. If the previous word, porni, referred to male prostitutes, then obviously this would mean something else. But if the previous word simply meant sexual, sexual licentiousness, then here we have a word most likely referring to a male prostitute, an effeminate one. This is not a condemnation, by the way, of, of certain types of men who maybe aren't as filled with testosterone as others. This is not an issue. This is, what we're talking about here is those who act in this way, those who act in this way, purposefully effeminate because of sexual issues. And then the final word, which is the one that is hotly debated, but funny enough is the most crystal clear in the Greek, arsenokite. Arsen in Greek means male. And then kite, beds. Okay, so literally in the English you would put here men bedders or men sleepers. You'll find sometimes uh, for those who argue that homosexuality is not even addressed in the Bible, this argument. It wasn't until 1946, it wasn't until 1946 that we even begin to see the word homosexuality in English translations. And so you can see this is a modern idea that has crept into the text. Well, that's because English is a language that is still developing. The word homosexuality is a relatively recent word in English. Having been developed mid 19th century or so by psychiatrists to describe this particular type of activity. Why would they do this? Well, they had a perfectly nice word before. It was called sodomy or sodomite. But this word didn't really describe the problem the psychiatrists wanted to address. A sodomite normally refers to a male homosexual in that older English. But there is another issue, and that is that the psychiatrists were noticing there are also female homosexuals, which to call sodomite would be a little odd. And so the psychiatrist developed another term, homosexual, that is same sex, which then is a way to medically discuss this tendency that you find not only among males, but also among females. And so, yes, it eventually comes into English translations about a century later, as the term becomes uh, a word that is found in common English, and then finally makes its way into translations. The word here, male bedders or male sleepers, however you want to translate that, could not be any more clear. We are talking about men who lay with other men. And the text itself is related to the text we looked at in Leviticus, where we heard about the worship of Moloch, idolatry, along with a condemnation of homosexuality. Here then, also in Paul's epistle, he discusses immorality in general, most of these of a sexual nature, but also reminds them of the condemnation of idolatry and, of course, 
also of homosexuality. Now turn with me to our last passage for our discussion today. And that is in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. After Paul wrote that first letter to the Corinthians, he traveled up through Troas into Macedonia and eventually made his way down to Corinth. And I'm sure he took care of business when he got there. While he stayed there, he wrote another letter, the letter to the Romans. And it's important to hear the letter to the Romans in that context. Most people don't know when Paul wrote his letters. And when they come to read his epistles, don't understand the connection or relationship of some of these epistles. There's an intimate connection between Galatians 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans, all wrote on his third journey. And a very important connection between Romans and his letters 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians. Because it's in the city of Corinth when he writes to the Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men, who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. What is he talking about? This is called natural revelation. We have special revelation. God reveals information to Abraham. God reveals to Israel at Mount Sinai, his Ten Commandments. Special revelation. But we also have natural revelation. And we find this in a number of biblical texts, and this is one where we find Paul using this topic of natural revelation to address a problem. Man should know that there is a creator by looking at creation. Man should be able to perceive through natural revelation, that is through looking at the trees, the birds, a, a babbling brook, even looking under a, a microscope, looking at the heavens, looking at the world, that there is a creator, and therefore they should acknowledge that in how they live. How so? Well, it's from the created order, from this created world through natural revelation that we get what is called natural law. From natural revelation, by looking at the created order, how things work, we are supposed to be able to discern certain principles and that is what we call natural law. And Paul refers to this here. He says, verse 20, Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, or birds, or animals, or reptiles. Here Paul refers to polytheism looking to the created world that was intended to be the thing through which they perceived natural law, the thing through which they were intended to experience the glory of God. 
like a great sacrament through which we would experience God. They begin to look at the creation and think of it as the gods of this universe. And so they, they saw the power of a lion or the power of an ox. And in that saw the power of a deity. And this is what he means. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. Rather than see the creator and knew that he had created them and share in that glory and that relationship, they chose to turn away from him and look to the creation and try to imitate it instead of the imitation of the one who created them. He goes on to say, with this polytheism, with this paganism, with this turning away from God, then came, verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. So when they turned from God, from worshiping the one true God, from imitating the one that they were created to imitate and grow in his image and likeness, like a child growing up in the image and likeness of their parent. When they turned from that, and their minds were darkened, God allowed them to continue to run wild. He gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They turned to worship the creature rather than the creator, he says. This is paganism. Now, what did he mean in verse 24 when he said, therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves? He explains that now. In verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women. How so? He says, they were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men. And receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. St. Paul then goes on to say what happened next. In verse 28, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind, to improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, and he goes on. So what Paul shows us is when they turned from God, when they turned from their source of life, like a child turning from the direction and care and love of their parent, like a child running from the home, and ending up on the street and imitating the wickedness they might find there. So also God's creation did likewise. They turned mankind, turned from their creator, their father, and for the purpose for which they were created. And rather, like that child, ran out into the street and did what they found there. And St. Paul goes on to say, because they did this, this led to, this led to sexual licentiousness. And here Paul gives us the most grievous kind. Homosexual activity among the men and among the women. And because they did that, he says, then God allowed them to fall even further. And he describes all of the various types of activities they then engaged in. We have been looking at 
eight passages in the sacred scriptures which comment on the topic of homosexuality, either directly or indirectly. The purpose here is to make something very clear. The Bible does address the topic of homosexuality. And the Bible does condemn that type of activity. Anyone who suggests otherwise has clearly not read these texts very carefully. Or, as I've often found, ever read them at all. So in conclusion, I would like to turn back to that letter to the Corinthians to end on a bit of a positive note. Turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We read a passage, but I stopped short of reading what Paul said next. And that's what I want to address now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul said, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, feminine ones, however you want to translate that, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, my brethren, he says. And then he says this in verse 11. And I think here is where we find some hope for our modern situation. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Paul knows this community well. When he came to Corinth, he found a Greek city in all of the ways that cities are Greek. He found all sorts of sexual licentiousness and immorality of every kind. Thievery, adultery, sodomy. He found drunkenness. He found everything you could imagine. But Paul went to them because God had called Abraham for the sake of the nations. God had called Abraham so that through his seed, all the nations could be blessed. And that seed, as St. Paul said in his letter to the Galatians, is Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus is that seed through which all the nations shall be blessed. And this is why Matthew's gospel, after having told us that he is the son of Abraham in the beginning of the book, concludes by telling us that Jesus commanded his disciples to go out and baptize all nations. Make disciples of all nations, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have taught you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Paul knows this commandment. And Paul has gone to Corinth to bring the nations in back to the family of God for which they were created. And so Paul went to Corinth, a city with all sorts of sin, sorts of evil, and he called the people like Jesus did in Galilee. He called the tax collector from the ta tax booth. He called the harlot from the street. He called the sinner from their sin and said, come, follow me, and I will give you a new life a new life. And they did. And this is exactly what Paul, the great apostle, did. He went to Corinth and he called them. He found harlots in the street and said, let me tell you about, let me tell you about Jesus. He found adulterers in the, in the bar. 
He found thieves in the alleyways. And he went out there and found that lost sheep that Jesus had spoken about. And he brought them into the flock. But tragically, in Paul's absence, many of them had fallen back into this way of life. We can surely understand how hard that would have been for them. But Paul reminds them of something very important. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. This is the opposite word of what we heard Beginning, in the beginning, verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says in verse 11, such were some of you. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were revelers. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you were thieves. Some of you were homosexuals. Some of you were male prostitutes, fornicators. But you were washed. It's a reference to their baptism. You were sanctified and were justified. You were made righteous. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. This is what Peter had preached to the crowds at the first Pentecost of the New Covenant. In Acts chapter 2, we hear about Peter's speech telling them about the Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do, brethren? And he said, repent, repent. That is, change your life. Repent, change your life. And the Greek literally, turn around. Go the other way. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul is reminding the Corinthians here, and therefore reminding us, that through our baptism, we are a new creation in Christ. As he said in the letter to the Galatians on the same journey in chapter 3, verse 27, all of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. You've been restored to the glory that Adam and Eve once had in the garden. As he said in his letter to the Romans on the same journey, in chapter 6, all of you who have been baptized into Christ have died with him, have been buried with him, and have been raised with him to newness of life. How so? Because all of those who have been baptized entered into the church on the day of their baptism. In that ancient liturgical tradition, they were confirmed as well. Many of you who are of the Latin tradition have seen this at least on Pascha or Easter Vigil when an adult comes into the church. They are baptized. They are confirmed. And now their sin has been forgiven and they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, as Peter said, and now they are able to eat of the tree of life. They are now able to eat of the tree of life that Adam was prohibited after the fall. What is that tree of life? Jesus said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus came to conquer sin and death. Jesus came to restore mankind to the original plan of God. Jesus came as the seed of Abraham through which all the nations could be blessed. 
And if you are blessed by God, that is, you have received life. And in this case, eternal life. Glory be to Jesus Christ, with his eternal Father, and his all-holy good and life-giving spirit, both now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen.